We use our cutting edge technology and collaborative client focused brokerage team to provide the highest level of professional service at all stages of our clients' investments. Our team has decades of experience in all types of markets, guiding clients through some of the most challenging times for investors. Our all hands on deck approach generates more offers on your listing and according to CoStar, we have sold our listings faster and with the highest list to close percentages over the past two years. For buyers, we identify and negotiate the best terms possible, ensuring your long term success. We hope your time with us today helps your passive investments become massive investments. Centennial Advisors, here for you now and always. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin White. It is March 14th, 2024. I'm the managing partner of Centennial Advisors, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, as you heard in the open, we like to take a cutting edge and collaborative approach to helping our clients do better. And one of the ways of doing that um, is working with Mark Perlberg, who's going to join me today and talk a lot about, uh, let's call it real estate and tax savings. Uh, Mark is the founder of MarkPerlbergCPA.com, where you can find him. And he's, um, what I would say is, as I've learned over the last few years, a foremost expert um, and total nerd when it comes to trying to figure out ways to help people save money on taxes. So, Mark, thank you for joining us. If we can start, how did you become so passionate about what you do? So, I, you know, I would say that I was really bored. <laughs> I was an internal auditor um, and doing audit work at one point in my life. And I knew that there was more that I could do with my knowledge. And I was always really enthusiastic about real estate. My original plan was to just use that to finance uh, some real estate and eventually get out of being an auditor. But as I hung around other investors, I realized one of the best investments you can ever have as an investor is going to be your tax plan as people started asking me about tax strategies. And I found that with an effective tax plan, your the savings that you can create can sometimes be 10, 15, 20 times the investment into a strategy. So I, I realized how powerful you it is to navigate the world of taxes and what amazing things we can do. And I became obsessed. And that led to one... So that led to, to two to four to eight and more and more referrals until this became a full-blown practice with about 12 people on the team now. Well, I think it's pretty, going to be a pretty exciting day because on our end, we think that the that real estate is the way that every, you know, everyday Americans can create and build wealth. And you, when you combined it with your excitement for tax strategy, um, should be pretty, uh, pretty neat today. Some of the topics we cover and some of the ideas that we share. Uh, just for everybody who's listening now, um, or even if you get this on the recording, uh, if you have a question, we ask you to use the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. We're going to try to get to them, uh, but if we don't, because of either time or topic, um, we'll make sure that you get the answers from Mark and we get those to you um, so all the questions get answered. But let Mark, let's get right into it. Let's talk about maybe the first thing or, or where we wanted to start today, which is depreciation. Um, if you wouldn't mind, talk a little bit about that. Talk about its significance, its importance, um, and what people's different options are as it relates to effectively utilizing depreciation. Yeah. So when you talk about the tax benefits of real estate investing, you can't ignore the bit, one of the greatest advantages, which is depreciation, which is to account for the wear and tear of that property. Even though your light, your property is most likely going to increase in value over time, you're going to be writing off uh, the building over time. So the depreciation is to account for the wear and tear of your assets over time. So what we see with many of our clients even though you may be cash flow positive, depreciation is a non-cash expense. It's and it is going to what we call the the phantom expense, and that will most likely offset your rent revenue. And 
result in you not paying taxes on your positive cash flowing real estate rental assets. So that may sound wonderful, but if you really, really want to see the benefits of depreciation, you do what is called a cost segregation study. And you'll see just a brief, a, a small, a minor illustration on the next slide on that. And um, the cost segregation study is going to allow you to accelerate that depreciation on your real estate by I, instead of depreciating it over 27.5 or 39 years, which is quite a while to write it off this property. You can, you can identify property that, that depreciates faster and get massive write-offs in year one. Mark, we're going to move over to that cost segregation slide in a second. We're, I think it's stuck a little bit. But maybe real quick, um, two questions for you. What are the different types of, let's call it depreciation methods? You mentioned cost seg, and then you talked about 27 and a half or 39. Maybe briefly talk about what the different options are. And then question for you um, that I was asked recently is, do I have to take depreciation? And if I don't have to, is there ever a scenario where you would advise that? Right. So you, if you don't do anything at all, the default, the standard method is you would write off your, if it's commercial real estate, you write off over 39 years or you write off residential real estate over 27.5 years. And you have to record at least some depreciation because you're records would not be compliant if you didn't account for the assets on your tax return. So you would be out of compliance if you didn't have at least some depreciation tax deduction. Now, cost segregation would be an optional decision. And there are all sorts of ways where you can, when if you were working so with someone who understands the tax law and can strategize with you, there's all sorts of uh, analysis and de decisions to be made on how we're going to depreciate this property. Okay. Um, and then I'll, let's talk a little bit about cost seg. And like I said, we're, we're working through the slide. So be patient with me here. Um, sure. But uh, in cost seg, what are the benefits to somebody? Because I think one of the questions that people would ask is, well, if I use it up faster, how do I get more? Or what do I do if I use cost seg and I use it up faster? Right. So the when we think about the benefits here is there are ways where you can use your tax losses to offset other sources of income. And the name of the game here is you create tax savings by accelerating the depreciation and creating losses that will reduce your taxes. And when you have tax savings from the cost segregation studies, that gives you more cash. Now, yes, you do lose future depreciation. That is true. So what you want to do here is you don't want to just take your tax savings and buy yourself a Ferrari for your personal usage because then you'll see the disadvantages in later years of less depreciation. The purpose of this tax incentive is to give you the opportunity to reinvest into your wealth and your business. So ideally, you're going to get a refund or you pay less in taxes and that additional savings can be used to buy more real estate. And that real estate gives you more depreciation. You may even do another cost that can take create more tax savings. So, you know, ideally, if you're stra if you have a right strategy in place, you're creating tax savings and reinvesting that tax savings to give access to more and more depreciation as your portfolio expands. Mark, I'm going to run a couple numbers that I had done just and you tell me if we're at least in the ballpark to kind of give everybody the examples here. That yeah. For example, if you had acquired a property and the basis, your new basis in the property um, was going to be a million dollars, that in the first five years, if you use straight line depreciation on a multifamily asset, you'd have about 180000 in depreciation that you would take. But if you used cost seg like you're discussing, you would have about 320000 now, I know that you might not have a calculator in front of you, but ballpark-ish, that's kind of what we're talking about in the significant amount of, let's call it access to, to your cash that you can get by using cost segregation. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it depends on the property, obviously, but even, you know, 
without I don't think we have time to go too deep in the weeds here. But even as we lose our bonus depreciation you know, or it phases out, and we don't even know if that's going to happen yet, that's a whole other conversation. We don't even know what the courts are going to decide yet, but uh, the legislation will decide. But what we're going to even even with that, you're you're still moving that depreciation up and getting those tax deductions earlier, and get and because of that, it creates tremendous opportunities to have more capital. To and more liquidity to continue to build your wealth. Mark, on the cost segregation, like I think part of this is the the client has to spend a little bit more money, right, to get a cost segregation study done. Yeah. Um, in your practice, always worth it, always valuable. Um, got any insights or comments there about the cost of it relative to how much it benefits someone? Yeah, you know, first and foremost, we got to make sure there's some benefit because, you know, certain factors have to be present. Do we have real estate professional tax status? Do we have a short-term rental where we can use the losses to offset the income? Is there income to be offset? So we have to run some scenarios. And basically, you want to look at this like any other type of expenditure. What's the return on investment from the cost seg, and you usually we can make a pretty reasonable assumption on how much additional tax deductions we'll get from the cost seg, based on the client's income and other all sources, all its other sources of income, and that'll allow us to to determine whether it's worth the investment into the additional procedure. Maybe that leads to two questions that now I'm intrigued by. Number sure. one, I own an investment property. Do I get to write off the cost seg cost? Yeah, absolutely. Professional services. 100% tax deductible. Um, all right. And then what like what do they cost? Or what's the if somebody has, let's call it a two to five million dollar property, are they spending a hundred grand on these things or are they spending 10 to to 15? Like any ideas on the the ballpark for people? Yeah, so I would approximate somewhere between five and eight thousand dollars, maybe ten thousand dollars if it's a complex type of mixed use commercial type of property. So let's say five to ten thousand dollars for that cost egg study. And I mean, we're gonna in this example here, we're gonna free up hundreds of thousands of dollars of tax deductions. So if if the cost segs are worth the investment and we have a high income earners. I mean, it's a no-brainer here. We often have cost segregation studies that create tax savings 10, 15 times the investment into the procedures. Well, that's fantastic. You had mentioned it a second ago. And so cost segregation certainly uh, speeds up the depreciation, gives you access to utilize those dollars to protect more cash flow. Um, the next level up would be bonus depreciation. Um, on your slide here, I think those numbers come from the Tax Cuts and Job Act of 2017. Um, Correct. The bonus depreciation in 24 is 60 percent, and does that, and then 40 percent in 25. Does that mean you get 60 percent in year one? Talk a little bit more about bonus depreciation and how you're using that with clients. Right. So let's say, well, based on the way the current legislation is written, and things may change. So today, if you're listening to the recording, is March 14th, 2024, and you may want to verify that nothing has changed since this recording. But let's say we do a cost segregation study in a property purchase in 2024 based on how it's currently written. Um, and we identify five and 15-year life property of $100,000, let's just say. Keep it simple. Our We'll get... In addition to the ability to write that off over a shorter period of time, we'll also be able to write off upfront 60% of that. So that's that would be, in this example, a $60,000 tax deduction um, that we would get immediately. Now, the rest would be depreciated over the identified life of that property. So if the property depreciates over five years or 15 years, you would still get those that up for, that accelerate you would still depreciate over a short period of time, but you wouldn't get to write off more than you would only get that 60% upfront tax deduction right away from the bonus. 
So on bonus depreciation, we've done a fair amount of work in the convenience store, car wash, collision yeah. centers, um, because C-store. those qualify for bonus depreciation. Is there any other, let's call it types of real estate that you've done transactions on that qualify for bonus depreciation that people maybe should consider or yeah. So what kinds? You know, I I think that we, there are some types of real estate that give you a lot of bonus depreciation. So if you want to really win the tax game, you can consider, well, you mentioned C stores. So like convenience stores and gas stations, you can, you would, in that example, you'd write off 60% of that value of the gas station, which is really awesome. Uh, now there are also mobile home parks can give you a really good amount of bonus depreciation. If you have a, we see sometimes we have short-term rentals with pools, swimming pools, it would be 15 year life property. And therefore you would write, you would get to write off 60% of all of that value. And usually the value is pretty high for the swimming pools. So we like those for bonus depreciation as well. Uh, but at the same time, I would say, Right. In most real estate, we can justify doing a cost seg and we don't want to just invest in real estate for the tax savings. So, you know, multifamily could be is decent. Um, you know, uh, other types of real estate investing will still give you some tax benefits. You may see a little less from self storage or, or commercial real estate. Mark, question for you that people might be wondering as you talk about these awesome you know, additional depreciation opportunities. Um, somebody bought a property three or four years ago and their tax professionals have been advising them to just use straight line. Can you, after the, can you go back or can you do a cost seg um, or can you get the cost seg benefits or get bonus depreciation if you didn't claim it, let's call it in the first year? <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. And here's something that's really cool. So you can do a cost seg, even if it's after the year of purchase. And with bonus depreciation supposedly phasing out, let's say this property was purchased in 2022. We we would get what was what we'll call Section 481A adjustment bonus uh, catch up depreciation, which basically accounts for what depreciation did we miss out on had we taken that bonus depreciation and done the cost seg. And that assumes that's based on the 2022 bonus depreciation amount would be 100%. So there's a lot of opportunities if we find that, hey, you know, we could have done uh, this year, we could do a cost segregation study and we'll be able to uh, get a bunch of depreciation to offset prior year returns. And you can also go back and amend a prior year return and do a cost seg as well. Okay. That, that's super intriguing. I mean, as we talk to our clients, I would say 95% of them use straight line. Some of them paying a significant amount of tax still on the income from the property and the ability to go back and do that or to do it now and get, you know, get the benefits um, is, a, is a great uh, thing that would be available. We do have a question mark. It says, does a multifamily property qualify for bonus depreciation? Or maybe the question is under what circumstances or what might it have to have in order to get some bonus depreciation? Yeah. If you did a cost segregation study on a multifamily, you would identify property that qualifies for bonus depreciation. And that would give you tax savings if if everything else made sense. Okay. So Rocky, I think the answer to the question really is, is that there would be pieces that where you would get cost segregation, bonus depreciation benefits. Some of the things in the property would be that, and then others would be more longer term depreciable, let's call it parts of the asset. Um, Awesome, Mark. Thanks for kind of going through the three different types of depreciation that people have available to us. On the next slide, I think you've got some really interesting stuff to kind of maybe go into a little more detail on how you use it with clients um, and what and that the maybe that the objective is to have tax losses. Right. So depreciation here, 
you know, which we can maximize with cost segregation study. At the very least, you can use this to make sure that you're not paying taxes on your rent revenue. It's very rare that we have clients with real estate, even successful cash flowing real estate. It's extremely rare that they actually are paying taxes on that rental revenue. But what can be really, really helpful and can be transformative in some of our clients' lives where we can save them hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars is that when we create these negative income statements from this real estate with these cost segregation studies, it in certain circumstances, you can offset other sources of income. If you if you if the right facts align, you can create losses with cost segregation studies and then use those losses from the depreciation to offset some of the taxation on your W-2 income or your 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 business income if, in certain circumstances. And that's really where the magic happens, where we have clients who we can save them, you know, we can get, we've seen six-figure tax refunds as a result of the cost segregation study. Well, I think you just piqued everybody's interest. So do me a favor, on your... On the slide here, we have STRs and rep status. We'll take them one at a time, but can you define what an STR is? And then how hard is it to be one? And if you are one, what can you do? Yeah, so short uh, STR stands for short-term rental. If you have a short-term okay. rental where the average length of stay is seven days or less, so often Airbnb, VRBO, uh, basically... Under normal circumstances, you can't use real estate losses to offset your W-2. But if you have a short-term rental where the average length of stay is seven days or less and you self-manage and materially participate, the IRS is not going to treat that as a passive loss. It's kind of more like a hotel, like a regular business. And now you can use those losses to offset your spouse's W-2 income or your W-2 income. So we see a lot of high-income earners especially from California and dentists and doctors and successful business owners who want to see a tax savings from their re real estate investing. So they're investing into these vacation homes and STRs. We, and now we can use the losses to offset that highly taxed income in, from your other sources of your job or your business. So what is it? What are the qualifications? So, yeah. So, and we'll talk about real estate professional tax status in a little bit, but short-term rentals, all we have to say is that the average length of stay is seven days or less. And you'll om that'll almost always be true with Airbnbs. And we need to say that you materially participate. So uh, the easiest way to say that you've materially participate is that you put in a hundred hours and more than any other single individual into the oversight and the management of that real estate rental property. Very easy. I wouldn't say easy, but it's very feasible for you to achieve those two attributes when you buy a short-term rental. And now we can do cost segregation studies and create losses to offset your other sources of income. I'm sure that's helpful to everybody listening. Now let's talk about rep status. Um, yeah. Again, find what it is. How hard is it to be one? And what can you do if you are? Right. So the SDR loophole is an more easily attainable uh, attribute where we use to, to reduce our clients by hundreds of thousands, of millions of dollars. The real estate professional tax status is a little trickier because we need to say that either you or your spouse work full time in real estate. And by full time, I mean you put in at least 750 hours and more than 50% of your time is dedicated to a real estate trader business. If we can say that, though, now we can take those rental losses. If you also materially participate and self-manage your rentals, we can use those rental losses to offset other sources of income, whether it be W-2, whether it be business income whether it be uh, capital gains from your stocks or sales of your business, you can now can use these losses, these paper losses from your cash flow positive real estate to create additional tax savings. 
Mark, on, on this rep status thing, we work with a lot of clients that have had successful careers and they bought a bunch of real estate. And then as they've gotten older, they've retired from their career and they own and operate their real estate. Uh, do you advise clients when they stop, let's call it having a full time job to be a retiree or to be a or to move to rep status? Like, yeah. is there a difference for them and do they have to actively do it? I'm all Choose about one it. Or the other. Yeah. So I'm all about it. If you have the opportunity to get real estate professional tax status, let's say you move to working part time at your job or your spouse, even like let's say your spouse takes off time for maternity leave. Uh, I'm all about what I call the job exit tax strategy. And so let's say you're ready to transition out of your full-time job. Now there's all these opportunities. So let's say you didn't need a cost segregation study in the past. Now we have all this real estate and all these opportunities of depreciation. And we can do, do, do we can combine, we can do cost segregation studies when you get your real estate professional tax status to offset the taxation on maybe taking some funds out of your 401k, maybe do some Roth conversions now that we have rep status. I mean, you could use the depreciation to offset sale of some of your stock. All this whole world of opportunities opens up when you're ready to move into that position to achieve real estate professional tax status. All right. We're going to stay on this slide because I think you got some other interesting stuff on here that I want you to uh, address, but want to remind everybody who's maybe joined us after we started. Um, today, I'm joined by Mark Pearlberg. He can be found at www.markpearlbergcpa.com. Um, if you've heard the last, I guess I would say two minutes, you certainly are intrigued by some of the great ideas that he has as it relates to real estate owners and their ability to save taxes and put more money in their pocket. If you have a question, we ask you to use the chat section on the right hand side type your question in. Um, we'll take a look at it. If it's uh, if we've got the time for it, if it's on topic, we'll get right to it. Uh, if it's maybe one of those things holding us back, we will definitely take the question. I'll ask Mark, we'll get you the right answer and we'll get it to you. Uh, Mark, now the next thing I want to ask on here is unused losses carry forward. Um, I think I've got an idea there of what you mean, but I want you to just, you know, kind of make it clear for everybody what the opportunity is there, um, and what you're re referencing. Yeah, so we talked about instances where if you have a highly, if you are a successful business owner or have a W-2, you can use real estate not only to build wealth, but chop away at your taxes and get maybe massive refunds. But let's say you don't want to do short-term rentals. You don't want to deal with tenants calling you. You don't want to be a landlord. You just want to invest, and you can't get the rep status. You may find yourself a little bit up, you know, you're like, well, what's in it for me? And I want to emphasize that there's still a lot of benefit here. There's a, You're still winning the tax game if you're investing in real estate, even if you can't see a reduction in your current taxes, because you still have a tax advantage asset. And when you have these losses, you, you know, you're especially if you're just getting started, this is your first time to create tax deductions and write off your travel and, and, and there's all these you know, ways that you can maximize these tax deductions that are going to serve as wealth building opportunities. Because as you continue to invest, you may have capital gains events. And the accumulation of these tax losses will offset future capital gains, even with that real estate professional tax status. We see a lot of people investing into real estate syndications passively. And if you do so, you maybe get a K1 that's, that has a real, uh, has where they've done a cost segregation study and you're thinking, well, that's great, but I don't get tax savings. Well, hang in there. You're going to build up this reserve of all of these tax losses. So when you have these successful exits, you are not going to pay taxes on them, even though you're going to get lots of money entering your bank account from this real estate. Um, awesome. Yeah, I think that that's some of the things that, you know, we see our clients get stuck on is, is there a benefit to doing a cost seg when the, the depreciation exceeds the cash flow and building it up and banking those dollars to use in future tax years is certainly a really good strategy. We've got an, another question, Mark, and this one is, um, 
Assuming that someone has the same income now as when selling the property, is there still an advantage of using cost segregation or bonus depreciation? Absolutely. As long as you can use it to reduce your taxes. Because think about the time value of money. If you can create a refund or tax savings, what can you do with that cash? You can buy more real estate, do more cost eggs, get more cash flow, have more equity, which can result in more wealth. You can even put it into the stock market and have it grow in an index fund. So you're most likely, as long as you can create tax savings, it likely will be worth the investment into the cost segregation study. You know, I, I think that's such a good point. I'm glad that David asked the question because there like it's like well if i pay it later or i pay it now but no the, the key part is that you get your money now to be able to do something with it and make it work harder um for and you know that could be years worth of depreciation that you're going to get in the short term that you can utilize to make your you know your wealth larger i think the other part about it and and this is maybe mark then just a question is that okay so let's say i got to the point where i had no more basis to depreciate on my property. What do I do then or, or, or what are my options to quote unquote get more? So, you know, if you have no depreciation on that property, you've had it for at least 27.5 or 39 years. So it's likely that this real estate was purchased at a price far less than what it's worth right now. So... You can do a cash out refi to get cash as a down payment on more real estate to have more depreciation. Well, let's say you're a passive investor and you don't want to, you know, let's say you're done being a landlord and you're phasing out because, I mean, if, if you have no more depreciation and you've been in the game this long, you can invest passively in other people's deals. And as we were talking about earlier, in other real estate syndications that will give you access to more depreciation and more cash flow and more tax savings. Yeah, we see people use the 1031 exchange a lot as well. Um, Absolutely. Where they, where they, and they might move from one product to the next, but what we've seen when we look at the numbers and the models, if somebody uses cost seg, or if they like the type of properties they can get bonus depreciation on, and they use these accelerated depreciation strategies. And then when the income from the property exceeds the depreciation, they then go trade and acquire another asset. They, they are conservatively using leverage to acquire more depreciation, basically, whether that's a cash out refi or through an exchange. But while they're sheltering so much cash flow, they're also... I'm going to say conservatively, they're not aggressively using debt to acquire more wealth, which ultimately leaves more for their families and future generations. Yeah. And also, if you're going to do a 1031 exchange where you have zero basis in your property, you're likely deferring a lot of gain. And the replacement, the replacement basis in a 1031 is reduced by that deferred gain. So you, unless you're going to replace it with a property that's significantly of greater cost than what you're selling it for, you're likely not going to have access to a lot of depreciation. Awesome. Let's go on to the next slide. You've got an example that you want to kind of work through and describe the opportunities for people. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit, uh, where, where, do you know where this property is just from like a, we, we know where it's at and we hear the story behind it. Yeah, absolutely. So this was a client that was, uh, and he ran an insurance brokerage firm and he bought a property in South Florida. This was a beach house in South Florida, 1.925 million. So this client did not have real estate professional tax status. It was his first time being a real estate investor. And we, we saw a wonderful opportunity here to do a cost segregation study. And, you know, the client, you know, this was his first time. He didn't know, you know, if there was anything to reduce his taxes. He just wanted to know, you know, what, what, what should I be doing here um, to record my income? Am I going to pay taxes at all and this money coming in? Uh, but because he, he materially participated, we could use these losses as non-passive 
to offset the the income from his insurance brokerage firm. Now, when you say materially participated, what did that mean for the client in this scenario? So we need to say that him or he and his spouse combined for 100 hours and more time than any other person involved in this rental activity. Okay. So this was a short-term rental. Correct. Got it. Uh, question for you, not totally on the example, but I, maybe a timely one just because it looks like they did some some nice work to the property here. Um, and as you show a couple more pictures, it'll it come full circle. Uh, repairs or renovations, how should someone decide? And I bring that, my assumption, repairs are a P&L thing on an annual basis. A renovation might add to your basis. So yep. how does somebody decide? Talk a little bit about that. On, on how to treat those repairs and renovations? Yeah. So there's a few ways that we can look at this on deciding between whether something is capitalized or, de or expensed immediately. Uh, but the simplest way of looking at this that gives us, that would be most applicable to most of our audience members is we'll use what's called the de minimis safe harbor, where any expense after the rental is placed into service that is $2,500 or less, we can write off immediately and treat it as an expense. Anything that is greater than that, we would have to capitalize and depreciate over time. Got it. Perfect. Uh, let's go to the next slide. As you get into the cost segregation study um, for this property um, and some of the things you guys did. Right, absolutely. So this cost segregation study, and because there was a pool, remember, swimming pools in our real estate give you a good chunk of that bonus appreciation, which we all love. We created, the cost segregation study created $702,854 of depreciation in year one. So that was all tax deductions to offset his income from his insurance agency. And that's all year one. Correct. So Mark, my question for you, um, you know, it seems like as you do a study, there's the value of the improvements and there's the value of the land and you don't get to depreciate the value of the land. If I'm wrong, correct me in a second. Um, but my question for you is, who gets to decide what are the, the percentages, the value of the improvements, and what percentage is the value of the land of the purchase price? So our primary resource is the appraisal, if there was an appraisal done. Um, and if there wasn't an appraisal done, we would look at the tax assessments to see how they've assigned a valuation of the land versus the valuation of the improvements. Okay, so you, there's a couple sources you can go to, but it sounds like it's a little bit decided by the taxpayer and their professionals. Well, the appraisal is our usually, you know, the, the appraiser is what best will determine that valuation. And if not, we would look at the county records of what the tax assessment has allocated between land and improvements and that ratio would be applied to the cost of the property to determine the value of the land and the building all right let's go to the next slide so they got seven hundred and two thousand eight hundred and fifty four dollars um in depreciation year one from the cost seg study yeah so we our savings estimate was two hundred fifty eight thousand dollars this client was in a high bracket so and so Explain a little bit more for us, would you please? Yeah, right. So the difference between if the client had used us or and or and the, had not or if the client had not done a cost segregation study. And, and, you know, most people, most tax accountants who don't specialize in real estate don't even understand the unique treatment of short term rentals. So we approximated that we saved this client two hundred fifty nine thousand dollars in taxes by understanding the the tax code and the opportunities and treatment of short-term rentals and running the cost segregation study. That's 
fantastic. Um, oh yeah. I think anybody would love to save that amount in taxes. We've got two questions building up. Pearl, hold on just a second. I'm going to go to Rocky's first. I don't want you mad that I skipped you. Um, but Rocky's question for you, Mark, is what if there's no appraisal or what if the assessor's ratios just don't make any sense? So we've had instances where, here in California. yeah, you know, we once had an instance where the tax assessment was so, um, it, it was so uh, disadvantageous to the client that we ordered an appraiser to evaluate the property. And we added an additional couple hundred thousand dollars of depreciation by getting it reevaluated. Um, you know, if there's a possibility that this appraiser was negligent, you can always have another study. If you were to use the the, the tax assessment, you likely would be fine. Um, if, if, you know, we ideally were using the appraiser's information, but if we found that it was unreliable, we could rely on the county assessment information to determine the ratio of land to improvements. Okay, fantastic. So a uh, little bit more clarity there. I think that it's still somewhat, there's places that you can go, but if you don't love that number and you think that it might be more for the improvements, there's at least some strategies where you could try to find some supporting information for that. Um, Correct. Before we move on, Mark, we'll hit Pearl's question real quick, which is, so, somebody uses cost seg, somebody uses bonus depreciation. Um, if they're going to sell and cash out, which like from our perspective, we think there's so many other options for people to do. You mentioned a, a cash out refi to either acquire property or tap into the cash or, um, you know, we do a lot of exchanges into just easier to manage property, but somebody really, really wants out. They don't have a stepped up basis because of somebody passed. What happens if they use all this depreciation via cost seg or bonus depreciation and they sell? What is the depreciation recapture and how is that different or not different than if they just use straight line? Yeah, we use um, we've had these conversations because, you, you know, we don't want to just do this to reduce our taxes. And we often find high income earners getting seduced by the short term rental loophole or just real estate investing in general, and then they realize they don't want to be landlords or they bought an unprofitable property. So they sell it and they go, well, it's just capital gains. I'm not in trouble. Well, I'm only selling it for 10,000 more than I bought it for. And there could be some major pitfalls here if you don't plan appropriately. Because in this example, if we have a bonus appreciation of $700,000, you're going to recapture, you're going to pay as though you have $750,000 of income and it'll be taxed at your ordinary rate. The recapture of that, the depreciation that was taken for bonus depreciation is taxed at your federal marginal tax bracket. So it could be taxed as high as 37.5%. And then there's recapture of the straight line depreciation, which is at your marginal rate up to 25%. And then you have your capital gains brackets ranging from zero to 20 to 23.8 percent so there are some there there are some tax traps here but there are many capital gains planning opportunities where if you are proactive here and you're selling a property we can make sure we've reduced or completely eliminated the capital gains on this transaction Mark, we've got another question from the audience. Let me give it to you. If I sell my business and retire in February of 2024, I'm going to have, I have a cap gain of a couple million bucks. Could I buy a property with bonus depreciation and avoid all my capital gains? That's a great sale question. Of my business? We actually had a client like this. Um, and I was talking about it. I was at the Exit Planning Association. Client had a $10 million capital gain on the sale of his business. And we were able to create $4 million of tax deductions because his wife had rep status in that year. And so we were able to eliminate $4 million of the $10 million cap gain. We used some other strategies to eliminate the rest of it. But yes, if you have real estate professional tax status, you not only can you use the losses to offset your W-2 or your business income, you can also use it to offset the capital gains from stocks or sale of your business. A lot of versatility on how we can use these losses. 
but you got to make sure you get rep exactly. status. So when you quit your job in February, you got to make sure that you or your spouse are going all in on this real estate to get the rep status. Um, fantastic explanation. And I guess step by step of how somebody does it. Let's talk a little bit more about paying uh, no money on your capital gains. Absolutely. So, you know, and because I saw a lot of questions when you polled the audience, so some capital gains questions here. Uh, just some things to think about when you're going to sell these properties or the, even if you're a, lim a limited partner and there's capital gains. So those losses that you've accumulated, if you're not using them, let's say you don't have reps or short-term rentals, you can use those prior losses to offset future capital gains. We, we can talk for hours about 1031 exchanges to make sure you're not paying capital gains. We can create losses by doing cost segregation studies on other properties, creating tax deductions in our business. And we can also use losses if we have maybe some unrealized losses in our stock portfolio, those capital losses, loss in our capital gain. And there's also some really fun strategies with qualified opportunity zones that we can defer the taxes and get distributions to pay the taxes by investing our gains. Now, this is a loaded slide. I mean, we could talk for hours on each of these bullet points. So, uh, you know, if there's questions on this, we can have a lot of fun here. But there's so much opportunity and flexibility and planning to make sure you're not paying taxes on your capital gains. Well, I think you and I have talked for hours just on the opportunity zone one and yeah. the different ways that we've been helping people utilize opportunity zones as a way to avoid capital gains um, on the sale of business, art, Bitcoin, real estate, whatever it may be. Um, well, let's go to the next slide because I think Caden's question um, might apply to one of the things that you've got on here. And if anybody's got any more questions on some of these that we just saw on the last slide, um, Mark's got some more here on what you should be doing on an annual basis to maximize your savings. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Mark, you want, to, you want to go to Caden's, well, why don't you go through them and you might hit Caden's question. If you can't see it, uh, the question would be, what are the tax implications of changing ownership? For example, if I create a multi-member LLC with my kids, uh, when I pass, will the, well, will the property taxes be reassessed? Caden, I'm going to tell you that's probably a, a question that depends on the state. Um, as we know in California with Prop 19 and that yep. being passed, we are starting to see tax reassessments. Um, actually, we have a client right now that is going from a, I want to say an $8,900 property tax annually for a building they have to over $110,000 owned in the family for a long time and is now uh, getting a new basis because people had passed away. Um, so that might be a state specific question, but why don't you talk about, I know you've got entity structuring on here. Why don't you talk about a couple of these things um, and give some people some ideas on how to save every year? Yeah. So, you know, everybody knows that real estate is, is the most tax advantaged way to build wealth. Uh, real estate investor, I mean, our tax code really favors real estate investing. But if you are interested in real estate investing and winning the tax game, the way we see it, we want to make sure we're looking at everything. It's not just about real estate investing and cost segregation and 1031 exchanges. There's so many opportunities out there if you're a high income earner or a business owner. And some of the things you want to think about – have we considered available tax credits when it comes to having employees in particular and just being aware of state level tax credits? One of the most important, here's one of the things that I think every entrepreneur should think about. And even if you're a W2 guy, and you just got your first rental, understand, just understanding what is tax deductible and maximizing those write-offs. I call it write-off optimization. So how can we take ordinary events and activities, find business purposes for them, make them tax deductible and just understanding the law can create so many opportunities for our clients. We've had, we've had instances where we're just sitting down with the clients. We found hundreds of thousands of dollars of tax deductions. Entity structuring, it could be as basic as going from a sole prop to an S corp, 
But there's all if, as your income grows, you you're introduced to all new strategies of entity structuring that can create transformational tax savings, whether it be uh, from special partnership allocations and maybe creating additional spinoff entities. So a lot of fun conversations when we get into some higher income levels that may not apply to everyone, but we like to keep it's oftentimes we keep it simple, but we at least want to know where we have the most advantageous entity structure. And then there's so many other things we could do with our cash that are going to reduce our taxes. So obviously real estate, um, solar energy investing can give us tax credits under the right circumstances. Um, investing in, when I say partnership interest, investing into other people's businesses, like syndicated real estate invest or investing passively in like car washes. So many interesting, and exciting real estate investing and investing opportunities that will reduce your taxes potentially. I love talking about oil and gas to get that intangible drilling cost deduction. 80 to 90 cents per dollar of invested in the oil and gas will reduce your taxes. And you don't even have to do anything at all and you get tax savings. And then there's these charitable deduction strategies where we can offset as much as 60% of our clients' income with some unique structuring, timing, and valuation strategies of how we're getting charitable deductions. That's a loaded – I was probably talking too much. And that was probably a loaded slide here. But I, what I want to emphasize is if you're paying a lot in taxes here, real estate is wonderful. But after you've exhausted all our foundational real estate opportunities, there's so many other things we can look at to reduce your taxes. Well, and I, you know, I think that for most of our clients, there's plenty of opportunity to tap into the real estate um, related benefits. But then even beyond that, there's so many opportunities where, you know, you had said it earlier, like, you know, most of your clients aren't paying any taxes on their real estate. And I would say if we've got anybody who's on the phone that feels like they're paying taxes on their real estate every year, getting together with Mark and I, we can take a look at the situation and make some recommendations on from the tax perspective, from the real estate perspective, and create a, a plan that optimizes your position to make you as much money as possible and pay as little tax as possible. Uh, Mark, before we get to your top 10 items, we've got one more slide about some more year-end tax stuff. Why don't you briefly talk about that, and then we'll finish up with your top 10 things um, suggestions that uh, people can do to reduce or eliminate taxes. All right, absolutely. So it's not just about creating tax savings in the current year. So, you know, maybe you've heard about these things and you do the cost seg, you create massive savings, and that's wonderful. But we also want to think, how do we protect our wealth and how do we grow in a tax advantage manner? So some of the strategies or things to consider, one is income shifting. What I mean by that is, if we find you're in a really low bracket this year, let's move some income up and take advantage of that low bracket. Maybe free some stock. Uh, that's kind of tied to Roth conversion and stock liquidation. So let's say we have access to all this bonus depreciation and we can create more losses than we even need. Well, what we can do is still take advantage and prevent future taxation. We can do Roth conversions, convert an IRA or a 401k into a Roth and use the losses to offset those items. We can also liquidate stock, take advantage of the $0 uh, long-term capital gains bracket in some instances if, we're at, if we can use the real estate to drive us into a low bracket. Life insurance is a really popular vehicle for affluent uh, members to grow their wealth in a tax-advantaged manner where they can borrow from it and do other things with it in the future and pay no taxes on the growth of that life insurance. And other tax advantage investments, like investing into things like real estate, real estate would be one of them. Kind of, we touched on that earlier, but other investment vehicles that have favorable tax treatment and give you depreciation to let you grow and compound your wealth and protect yourself from Uncle Sam. It's awesome. It's been great. We've got 54 minutes of some awesome conversation. We're going to get to Mark's top 10 in just a second. Um, Rocky, we're going to get to a couple of your questions probably offline and I will get them to you, um, in the next day or two so we can get all those covered, but going to hit on Sean's question here. I'm out of depreciation on my asset. Can you explain how to create new depreciation through a 1031 exchange? And I think that, you know, we, we see that oftentimes with clients where 
you know, they bought a property a long time ago and, and Mark had mentioned it, you know, their depreciation was based on a very low purchase price. Now they're sitting on a ton of equity in the building. And in addition to the value of the property going up, that income stream has gone up every year and they end up paying a ton of taxes um, in income tax because they're not sheltering, they're not using their equity in the property to shelter their income as best as possible. And so whether it is a cash out refi and an acquisition, um, or we see people doing just buying a property that um, gives them a ton of depreciation year one and no, no or a ton of depreciation every year and no income, um, like the 20 year CBS sort of uh, zero cash flow deals that we see, or just a 1031 exchange where the owner uses a little bit of a little bit amount of debt to create some new depreciation. We oftentimes can help somebody go from where they're at to putting two or three times more cash flow in their pocket um, by effectively doing an exchange. Um, in the short term, making a lot more cash flow, and in the long term, creating a lot more wealth for future generations. Um, so I think that that's something that when you have it looked at, when you have somebody analyze exactly where the situation is at and, and really how good it's gotten because you paid so little, your depreciation is, is based on your acquisition price um, and the cash flow has grown, there's some tremendous opportunities that people can have to make more money today and maybe have less management, maybe have a newer building. If they've moved in the 20 years that they've owned the property, get something closer to home. Um, those are kind of the, the easy things that we can do via an exchange. You layer some of Mark's um, more sophisticated strategies on it and you're hitting, you know, five run home runs, so to speak. Um, Mark, let's go through your top 10 as we finish this off in the last four minutes, taking it from 10 to one, um, starting there in the top left of ways that people can save, reduce and eliminate taxes. All right, let's go from 10 to one, uh, 10 to one entity structuring. Do this at least annually, make sure you're competent in your entity structure, expense and income timing. I'm not sure that we might want to move that one up because cost that kind of fits into that. But the timing of events can have significant impacts on your taxes. Um, charitable strategies for some of our clients can be really transformative and can can reduce their taxes by a significant amount. Tax credits, if they are available, they are super awesome because you get a dollar for dollar return of your cash. Instead of paying Uncle Sam, you're investing or putting your cash to things that gives you tax credits. Qualified Opportunity Zones funds, it could be like a supercharged Roth IRA with unlimited amounts you could put in that with, with zero dollars of future capital gains. 1031 exchanges to defer gains indefinitely. Short-term rental loophole is really valuable for highly paid W-2s who can't get rep status and what massive tax reductions or highly paid uh, business owners. Uh, real estate professional tax status is wonderful when you have someone who has a business or a W-2 income and the wife wants to get involved in the real estate or the husband, and we can use those losses to reduce the taxes from those income sources. Understanding the tax law and capturing all your tax deductions is a crucial lifelong skill you can learn with a good advisor or a collaborator. And then what everyone, you can't talk about real estate tax strategy without talking about cost segregation studies. That is the bread and butter. That is just the Michael Jordan of real estate tax savings that can create, um, that we've done to create tens of millions of tax, of, of tax savings for our clients. Mark, it's been an awesome hour. When I look at this list between the, I think, 50 or 60 million we've helped people save through opportunity zones in the last couple of years, the exchanges, and then you layer some of the this other stuff. It's it's really incredible how much we can help people um, save, reduce, and eliminate taxes. It's been a phenomenal hour of hearing your insight um, and how people can do it. As you know, we've had a lot of success in the last few months as we've introduced some people to you that are super satisfied with the suggestions and the ideas that you're giving them to 
to save more money. Mark's information is down there on the bottom. You can reach him at info at Mark Perlberg, P-E-R-L-B-E-R-G-C-P-A dot com. We certainly have Mark's information. Again, Mark, thank you very much. It's been a fantastic hour, and I look forward to talking to you again soon, bud. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to present. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.